There were two reasons, I believe, why my respected father-in-law should take up the game of golf. And both of them are characteristic of a foresight. First, on his 69th birthday, he was presented with an old set of clubs by that apostle of fitness, Jack Cardigan. And Forsythe's refused to waste anything, even an unwanted gift. For the second reason, one must look to that dogged tenacity, so characteristic of Forsythe's in general, and of Fleur's father in particular. Having set his hand to the plough, whether it be golf, defaulting managers, or libel suits, a Forsythe never gives up. And although it may be hard to imagine him, at his age, as a serious contender for the amateur championship, it will certainly not be for the want of trying. Oh, whatever it is you're doing, dear boy, I do wish you'd stop. Stop? I'm convinced you'll do yourself an injury. Nonsense. It's very good for the liver. Mm, disastrous for the lawn. Mm. Here's a telegram for you. Oh? Good God. And what is it, dear? Well, it's from Michael. He wants to see me tomorrow. That red-haired baggage... What's her name? Marjorie Ferrer. Mm. She's suing Fleur for libel. I thought she was suing you for slander. Why doesn't libel have to be written down? Yes. Excuse me. Well, Coca, a tiresome journey, but here we are at last. Ah, uh, there you are. It's good of you both to come up at such short notice. Flo's in the drawing room, sir. There's a pretty pair of shoes. <laughs> Told you not to let her go around abusing that young woman. Well, I know, sir, but Flo doesn't consult me every time she writes a letter to one of her friends. No, it's pretty friends. Well, let's have a look at the writ. It's here, sir. Hmm? Freddy. It all seems rather petty to me. Now, why doesn't Fleur apologise and have done with it? Oh, she won't hear of it. She's spoiling for a fight. Well, I think she's a silly girl. Well, well. Hmm? Oh, there you are. Now, this thing, they, they want an unqualified apology and damages. And she won't eat your words, I suppose. Well, do you want me to? Hmm? Well, no, why should I? I'm in the right. Well, let me tell you something. From bitter experience, the courts exist to penalise people who are in the right. Now, these words they complain of, uh, snake of the first water, hasn't a model about her. Well, they're true. Yes, but the trouble is, old thing, where's the evidence? Exactly. All right. If she wants to be opened up, she shall be. I know she flew to Paris with Walter Nasing last November. Oh, surely, dear. People can fly in couples ah, without Ah, but Annabelle Nasing said she didn't mind Walter flying to Paris with Marjorie. But she only wished that she'd been told beforehand, so that she could fly there with somebody else. Good gracious me. Well, perhaps we could subpoena that woman, Mrs. Uh, Nasing. Oh, she'd never give Walter away in court. Oh. Well, what else about Miss Ferrer? Everybody knows she's having an affair with Aubrey Green. Oh, but he's a friend of yours. Well, he has been until now. Yes, but, Fleur, between everybody knows and somebody tells is a great gap fixed. Mm. Oh, she just wants money out of us, as if she cared whether people thought her moral or not. She despises morality, all her set do. Her view of morality. 
Well, perhaps we needn't go into personal details at all. What, do you mean get her to admit that she's read certain books, acted in certain plays, danced yes. certain dances? Yes. But you know, it might work. Except that one's own point of view isn't quite that of a British jury, sir. I mean, even oh. yours and mine, I expect, don't precisely tally. Well, yes, I know what you mean, Michael, but you get a clever barrister and he can turn the whole thing into an indictment of the, uh, the fast set and modern morality. Hmm. And then we won't be accused of exposing a woman's private life. Oh, yes. Hmm. Now, you'll have to give me the names of all these plays and books and uh, uh, dancing clubs and so forth. Oh, and I shall want all the information I can get about this affair with this uh, green chap. Well, you can't get that from me, sir. Hmm? I haven't got it. But do forgive me, Soames, but these books and plays and so on that you Yes, speak I mean, of... supposing I were asked if I'd read them. <laughs> Who could stand up today and profess to be shocked? Yes, you won't be asked any questions at all if I can help it. I thought Nobody will. Not... This thing's going to be settled out of court. Without an apology? Yes. Yes, of course. Well, it all seems a great deal of fuss about yes, nothing. So to do that, we need a strong case of justification. My father would have said, I can't imagine. Now we're going to frighten that young woman out of her wits. Mm. Now, Michael, you mentioned certain books she might have read. Have you any particular book in mind? Uh, well, let's see. Yes, there's a thing going the rounds now called Cantha. Called what? Cantha by Percival Calvin. Oh. It's published in Brussels. Oh. And sells privately over here. Is that, uh, is that an advanced book? Well, I haven't read it. But I gather the erotic passages are pretty hot stuff. Where can I get a copy? I'll get you one. Lunch is served, madam. Oh, oh, splendid. Thank you, Coco. Oh, by the way, I did hear something the other day, Michael. It, uh, it might help. Uh, do you know a man called Sir Alexander McGowan? He's an MP. No, I can't say I do. Oh, but well, I do, I'm sure. Huh? Yes, we met at Hattie Cheeseman's. He inherited a great deal of money, jute, I think, or something equally disagreeable, and totally doubled it in ten years. This is very interesting. But what one of you... those educated Scotchmen, you know, Fettis and Belial, Presbyterian, rather formidable. I didn't like him. Yes? Well, anyway, someone told me that he was after Marjorie. Hmm? Well, seriously. You know, marriage and all that. Oh. Well, sooner or later, she's got to marry money. And how will the do as Sir Alec like it if her dirty linen's on view all over London? Now, look here, Marjorie, there's just the one thing to be done. You've got to make our engagement public. Announce it in the Times tomorrow. Oh, no. You're still on probation. I'm not sure that I want to marry you. But I want to marry you. And that's that? That's that. Mm, no, Alec. I've made up my mind about marriage. I do, I'll tell you. Settle why thinks you've a good case. Mm. But I won't have you appearing in court. You won't have it? No. I'll go around and see Forsythe. I'll get an apology from him tomorrow. And from his daughter. I don't think you will. My father's seen old Forsyte and he wouldn't budge. The man's got a chin you could hang a kettle on. <laughs> this could be unpleasant for you, unless he settles out of court. I don't care a tuppenny turn. He'll settle. I've got those letters. He'd better settle. And I'll break every bone in his body. <laughs> Alec really must be 70. What about Mont? He's not 70. Michael? Oh, no, Michael's a dear. I can't have you breaking his bones. Oh, is that so? All right, then. Wait till he launches his fogatism nonsense in the house. <laughs> I'll eat him. Poor little Michael. Don't answer it. That's either a bailiff, in which case your advice is sound, or else it's a, a sort of American Prince Charming. And in that case, I don't choose to pass up. Mm -hmm. That's the expression they use, pass up. Don't you think it's divine? What American? <laughs> Away from stray from South Carolina and innocent from the heart of the heartland. And in that case, I don't care to pass up a Marjorie. very worthwhile experience. Now look here. I think on balance I'll take the risk. Who are you? My name is Wilmot. Mr. Francis Wilmot, of Naseby, South Carolina. And Francis, this uncouth person is Sir Alexander McGowan, of Dengowrie Angus. Sir Alexander? Miss Farrow and I are discussing business. May I suggest you leave us? Well, no, Sir Alexander, I can't do that. Why not? Because I'm here at Miss Farrow's invitation for tea. Is that true? Alec, I should warn you, a southern gentleman doesn't like to be called a liar. Isn't that so, Mr. Wilmot? I guess so, ma'am. <laughs> well, don't look so bewildered, Francis. Sit down. 
You behaved beautifully. You've made an enemy. Good. Ill-mannered brute. Is he always like that? No. But he's always passionate. <laughs> With you? Mm -hmm. Oh, Marjorie, are you telling me? He wants to marry me. But you would. I might. I don't believe it. Someday. He's a man. He loves me. England must be full of men who love you. Men like me. Oh, my dear boy, after three weeks... After three seconds. I knew as soon as I saw you that evening at the Mons. You think I'm crazy? Frankly, I think you're rather sweet, but... Look, for years I've been planning my trip to Europe, especially to England, where my folks came from. I wanted to see Worcestershire, Edinburgh Castle, the Tower of London, Crufts Dog Show, the Derby. The Derby. <laughs> OK, the Derby. Now... Now the only thing I want to see is you. And I do see you. Everywhere I look, there you are, day and night. Your face comes between me and everything else. Will you marry me? No, my dear child, I will not marry you. Don't you think you could love me? Ah, oh, now that's something quite different. Yes, I might be able to do that. Well, then. But I don't intend to. Why not? Because for you, love means marriage, doesn't it? It certainly does. I should say it does for any decent man. Yes. Now, tell me, if I did marry you, where should we live? Down in South Carolina? Amongst the cotton, surrounded by all those trees and cute darkies. It's very beautiful. I'm sure. But seriously, can you see me there? Yes. But if you don't like the notion, well, we can live wherever you want. Very well, then, Milk. Please. Did I tell you what it would mean? It would mean... a fair-sized house in London. Mayfair. Or Belgravia. Big enough for entertaining and a staff to match. All the clothes I want. And a trip to Paris whenever I feel like buying some. A house in Leicestershire for the hunting season. And a villa on the Riviera. Cap for I think. And that's just the beginning. Every year I should insist... Okay. I haven't got that kind of money. Well then, it's impossible, isn't it? I guess not. Because if you ever love me, you'll find that's all that really matters. You think so? I know it. Well, all I can say is don't bank on anything. Now you must go. But I have to... No clocks, I have to change. I'm late already. Shall I see you tomorrow? Telephone, about 11. That was nice. Don't make a habit of it, my skedaddle. Kensington 2902, please. Yes? Hello, Aubrey? Oh, good. Just to say I should be half an hour late. Mr. Wilmot, madam. Oh, not in Paris. How nice. Tea? Thank you, no. Oh. I've just had some. With Miss Ferrar? Oh, how interesting. Where did she pick you up? We met at my hotel. <laughs> a happy coincidence. Yes, it was. I want you to know I think she's a wonderful person. But Frances, I knew that. Yes? Well, why did you write me this letter? Did you show it to her? Lord, no. But I'd like to have you tell me what you mean by calling her the limit. And I'd like to have you tell me something. Why this vote fuss since our party? Well, what she said that night, I don't think she meant it. Indeed. Did she tell you that? Not exactly. She said she didn't mean us to hear it. Oh. Look, you've been real good to me. Why don't you come along with me and meet Marjorie? And, well, shake hands. You're from the South, aren't you? Any French blood? 
My grandmother was a French stock, so I guess I'm a quarter French. Yes, well, I'm more than that. But you ought to know the French don't forgive easily, and they don't persuade themselves into believing what they want to. I see. Before I leave, you're going to tell me what you meant by this letter. Am I? Of course. The limit of perfection. What else? Aren't you the living proof? Goodbye. I guess you'll have no use for me from now on. Goodbye, Francis. Good hunting. And that is why, sir, I regret that the speech from the throne foreshadows no coherent policy regarding either underemployment or overpopulation. But Fogartism will supply that policy. Now, while since the war, the population of this country has increased by two million, emigration has fallen from over 200,000 to 100,000. Our old markets in Europe are shrinking, so we must look overseas to the empire. But in order to create a new market there for our manufacturers, we must ensure a healthy growth of population able and willing to buy our goods. Now, Fogartism asks that you look ahead to fix your minds on a date, say 20 years hence, just a minute in the life of a nation, and to work steadily and resolutely towards that date. Jam yesterday, jam tomorrow. But no jam today. Exactly. Can we afford jam today? I think not, sir. Indeed, there are many people in this country without butter, let alone jam. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Now, the Foggart plan is to send out in great numbers boys and girls between the ages of 16 and 18 to the underdeveloped dominions. The British character of the British Empire will be established forever. It will become a self-sufficing unit. Supply and demand between the mother country and the dominions will be leveled up. And, and the, the dominions will then supply themselves. Yes. 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 Absolutely. The honorable member will forgive me if I doubt that. For many years to come, we shall be far ahead in the machinery of manufacture. But what is the alternative? To reduce wages and increase working hours in this country in order to compete with cheap labor in Europe? No, sir. I want better wages, even more moderate working hours. And that want is common among working men wherever the British flag flies. Yeah, 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 yeah. Talking through his hat! <laughs> but by equalizing the yes. land demand yes. within the sure it is. we can preserve Sir Alexander McGowan. our own standards of life. Oh, yeah. Now, there is another point in the pocket program. <laughs> England, as she now is, insufficiently protected in the air, lamentably devoid of food producing power, is an abiding temptation to the aggressive feelings of other nations. Here again, Fogartism requires... Fog, Fog, Fogartism! <laughs> shut up, shut up, give him a chance! Fogartism requires that we lay down our land policy so that in 10 years, we may be producing up to 70% of our own food and let that policy be as sacred as the League of Nations. And as damned! <laughs> the sacred and the damned. It sounds like a novel by Dostoevsky. <laughs> <laughs> well, we shall get nowhere without this damned sanctity. On our land policy depends not only the prosperity of farmers, landlords and laborers, but if another war should come, the very existence of England. One would like to applaud. He's done it very well. Emigration, the land. These two great issues demand the same sweeping attention as was given to vital measures during the war. As a nation, we have proved that in times of crisis, we can summon vast reserves of energy. We can snatch victory from disaster. And we can accept self-sacrifice for the sake of the future and our children. I put it to you that this is such a time. We dare not fail. I am honored, sir, in having been permitted to draw the attention of all parties to this inspired treatise by Sir James Foggart. And I beg the House's pardon for having been so long in fulfilling my task. Well 
I must uh, congratulate the member for Mid-Bucks on a lively and well-delivered first speech, though his appeal for less bread and more taxes savors more of Alice's wonderland than practical politics. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, the member for Tyne Tees earlier in the debate made an allusion to the party to which I have the honor to belong. I feel bound to say... Oh, you didn't mind it. Oh, you did splendid. Clever, clever boy. Oh, I'm ready. Thank you. Well, I said it all, but I don't think it'll have any effect. Oh, it's bubbly, I thought. Yes, of course. Can't win if you try to take your gift. Oh, my dear. Sorry. Well, Blythe? Well, one had heard a good deal worse. The point's got made. Oh, well, thanks. You should have got someone else to do it, you know. I don't carry the guns, Blythe. You will. Sensible, not too long. You'll do. <laughs> Thanks, Bart. Well, oh! Oh, oh, Fleur, oh, by the way, your, your father wasn't there. Oh, well, Michael did offer him a seat, hmm? but he said he hadn't been in the house since Gladstone moved the oh, whole Gladstone. rule bill. <laughs> and then only because he was afraid Grandfather would have a fit. That is not clear to me. Uh, well, Grandfather had a pass and didn't like to waste it. <laughs> <laughs> Dear Papa, so like him. <laughs> I don't know if <laughs> There you are, darling. Anything happen after I left? Papa? Oh, of course you don't know. That beast! Rich! That person in jute, I thought him in some. McGowan, he kept interrupting you. So that was McGowan. He made a speech after you left. Most unpleasant. Yeah, he doesn't care for fogotism, but there was more to it than that. Oh? Personal attack on you. He insinuated that you were interested in the sale of the Fogger book because Danby and Winter had published it and that you wanted it pushed. Good God! He... Well, you was right to the Times, Michael. Explain that you left off publishing before you were elected. That hairy haberdasher, give him the lie. Yes, but in private, in the press, or in the house book? All three. In private, you merely call him a liar. To the Times, you use the words uh, reckless disregard for the truth. And in Parliament, you regret that he'd been misinformed. <laughs> and you might add that men's noses have been pulled for less. <laughs> and it is a large yes, nose, it is most terrible. <laughs> yes, but look here, Bart. I mean, well, you don't think people wouldn't believe a thing like that about me, would they? They'll believe anything that suggests corruption yeah. in public life. Of course, you yeah. realise, Michael, don't you, why this McGowan attacked you? Because of Marjorie Feather. Exactly. Oh, no, yes. damn it all. Well, the, the house is free from that kind of pettiness. Oh, don't you believe it? Oh, oh, Michael, I have a piece of news for your father-in-law. Old Shropshire doesn't speak to Charlie Fellow anymore because um, the last time the old man paid his debts, he made that a condition. He was afraid of being asked again, not as lurid as I'd hoped. Oh, pity. <laughs> well, anyway, Michael, here's the old good health. We're yes, all Michael. very proud of Thank you. Thank you. Very yeah. congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Butterfield, what I have to say to you is confidential. You won't uh, discuss it with anybody. Certainly not, sir. Hmm. Well, do you know this novel? Yes, sir. It's printed in Brussels. Hmm. They're paying five pounds a copy for it. Hmm. You read it? No, sir. No, well, don't. Now, tell me, can you buy ten copies of this at my expense and post them to ten people whose names and addresses I'll give you? Oh, they're all more or less connected with literature. You can put in slips to say that uh, the copies are complimentary or whatever you call it, but mention no names. No, sir. It'll cost you well on 60 pounds. The price is rising all the time. Yes, never mind that. I see you no. wish the book to be boom, sir. Good God, no. I have my reasons, but, uh, well, we needn't go into them. No, sir. And you want the copies to come as if from heaven? Yes, that's it. <laughs> I take it that publishers uh, are in the habit of sending out books to people that they think will support them. Yes, sir. Mm. One other thing. I want you to call a week later on one of the people to whom you've sold the books and offer to sell another copy uh, as if you were the agent for it. I want to make quite sure that the copy's been received and read. But you won't give your name, of course. Now, will you do this for me? Oh, yes, sir. I owe you a great deal, sir. Hmm. Yes, well, uh, here's the... Uh, yes, here's the list of people. And I've underlined the one you're to call on. Thank you, sir. And I'll write you a check be going on with, and you can let me know later if there's, uh, there's anything more to pay. I see the person I have to call on, sir, is a lady. Yes. Does it make any difference to you? Uh, no, sir. Advanced literature is written for ladies nowadays. Mm, so it appears. I, uh, I hope you're doing well. 
Yes, splendidly, sir. I was very sorry when Mr. Mont left the firm. Hmm? We've been doing better ever since. <laughs> yes. Well, now, here's your... Uh, here's your cheque. Yes, sir. And thank you again. Not at all, sir. Mm. I'll report to you. Yes. Well, good night. Good night, sir. Well, dear, you missed ah. something. Huh? Michael did very well. Well, right. I say, he's got brains. Well, huh? mm. brains to stand up there. We uh, <laughs> met Butterfield going out. Anything new? Yes, I've uh, asked him to arrange something for me. Hmm? I want your help, too. Yeah? Uh, uh, do you know this? What's that? Canthar. No, I haven't read it. Everyone else has. No, I haven't. Should I? No, you shouldn't. Uh, I want it attacked. Oh, but they say it's unspeakable. Why yes. this sudden zest? Well, that young woman... Oh, uh, well. Yes. Uh, she belongs to a fast set. Mm? Mm? Call themselves advanced. Uh, if this thing were attacked in the press, in public, uh, mm. don't you think that would draw their fire? Uh, get them to defend it, you mm. mean, and then uh, use that as evidence of their views on morality? Yes, that's it. That's very cunning. Well, what's it about? Do you mind? Uh, you think you could find someone to do that for us? Well, someone whose name will act as a red rag. Yes. Uh, what about Walker of the protagonist? Just the type. Yes, you'd have to take it seriously. Oh, certainly. Show that it represents a school of thought, deliberate decadence. Yes, pornography for its own yes. sake. Well, yes. I am now bursting with curiosity. What mm. is this book? Well, in my young days, we would have uh, read it if we could and kept quiet about it. Nowadays, they make a splash of reading it and pretend it does them good. Oh, that sort of book. Mm. Walker must make it... A strong plea for censorship. Without that, they won't rise to the bait. You think not? No. Censorship is the red rag. I'll uh, look in at the Athenaeum tomorrow and see if Walker's still alive. Uh, thank you. Oh, I'm obliged to. Not at all. I admire your conduct of the case, but uh, forgive me. It would be better to prevent the case coming into court than to get a verdict if it did. Now, this chap McGowan, if he's serious, he'll fight. I shall offer them a settlement. Come in. Oh, oh, excuse me, ma'am. Uh, they, they didn't tell me you had visitors. <laughs> Good gracious me! Come in, come in. Oh, indeed, no, ma'am. I, I can come back. Why, but... oh, it's Mr. Soames. Yes, it is indeed. How are you? Oh, mm. I'm, I'm very well in myself, sir. Mm. Thank you. And I hope I find you the same. Yes. Cook and I were always talking about you, Mr. Soames, and mm. how kind you were when, when poor Mr. Timothy. Yeah, but Sir Lawrence, this is Smither, an old oh. friend and a servant in our family for how many years? Forty-three years, ma'am. Oh, good gracious me! How do you do? Oh. Sir Lawrence Mont is Miss Fleur's father. Oh yes, yes, I saw you in the church, sir, at Miss Fleur's wedding. Yes. Uh, how's Cook? She died, sir. Two weeks ago. Well, she was 73, and somehow, well, I don't know, uh, I think she just sort of pined away. So you're alone now? Uh, yes, ma'am, that's, that's really why I... Oh, but as I said before, I can come another time. Uh, Soames, why don't you give Sir Lawrence a drink? Yes, of course. You'll find everything you need in the dining room. Oh, uh, yes, quite, uh, Mont. Um... Yes, that would be delightful. All right, uh... Goodbye, and uh, keep in touch now. Oh, mm. indeed, yes, sir. Mm. Come on, yeah. one. Goodbye. Lorks, ma'am. Mr. Soames doesn't change a bit. No. Do sit down, Smither. Please, sit down. There we are. I was very sorry to hear about Cook. I do wish we'd known. Is there anything I can do? Well, I, I had thought, ma'am, of writing to that Mr. Gradman uh, to stop her pension, you see, now now she's gone. Well, shall I do that for you? Oh, oh would you, ma'am? It's been a load on my mind. Is, is there anything else? Well, well I, I don't know if I, I really ought... But 
up here. I will. It's what I come for. Will you take me on, ma'am? I? Oh, but Smither, I already have a parlour maid. Oh, no. She spoke to me. Well, I don't see that I could manage I'm to... I'm only 61, ma'am, and active with it. I know me place and I know me work. No, not like some of them nowadays. And then again, ma'am, I've got me pension, you see, so I, I shan't want much for wages. But really, the thing is, what service has been all my life, so to speak, and now with no family to do for and living on my own, well, it, it isn't natural, is it? No, it isn't. And I know how you feel. Smither, shall we give it a try? Oh, Miss, Miss Winifred, uh, I, I, Shall we say, the first of the month? Very good, ma'am. Mr Speaker, I rise to correct a statement in yesterday's debate, reflecting on my personal honour. The Honourable Member for Greengow said of me, I quote from Hansard, As a member of the firm who published this singular production, he is doubtless interested in pressing it on the public so that we may safely discount any enthusiasm displayed. It is true I was a member of the firm which published Sir James Foggart's book in August 1923, but I retired from all connection with that firm in October 1923, before ever I entered this house. I have, therefore, no pecuniary or other interest whatever in pressing the claims of this book beyond my great desire to see its principles adopted. I believe that the Honourable Member for Mid-Bucks was not sufficiently interested in his own speech to be present when I made my reply to it yesterday. I cannot admit that my words bear the construction he has placed upon them. I said, and I still say, that one of the publishers of a book must of necessity be interested in the success of any book published by his firm. The Honourable Member has placed upon his head a cap which I did not intend for it. <laughs> I am glad the Honourable Member has removed a construction which others beside myself had put upon his words. True. <clears throat> Very true. Now, sir, perhaps you'll tell me why you behave like a dirty dog. Oh, it's you, Mont. Take that! Oh! How's Blair? She's well, thanks. Would you tell her that I've had a letter from her cousin John? Here in great shape. Asked to send his love. Well, thank you. Um, won't you come and have some tea? Oh, thanks, no. Hey, you cut your hair? No. Somebody's nose. Well, I'm wanting to do that all the time. Whose nose was it? Oh, a man called McGowns. But, but that's a very nose! Well, I'm sure this won't be the first time that you've been in this room, Mr. Forsythe. No, indeed, no. I expected to see your father. Oh, he retired ten years ago. But uh, he remembers you. Indeed. Roberts versus the London and South Western, 1900. Yes, 1899. Yes, your father was for the company. Hmm. Well, now, this action. Yes, Mr. Forsyde. It's all very petty. What are we going to do about it? Well, that depends on what you have to propose. Hmm? My client has been grossly liable. Well, she began it. Anyway, what's she relying on? Private letters written by my daughter to personal friends in a very natural anger. I'm surprised that a firm of your standing would even... <laughs> I'm surprised that you're acting for your daughter. Oh, uh, do please sit down, Mr. Forsyde. Why? Well... You can, um, you can hardly see all round the matter. I don't agree. You've uh, come to offer an apology. 
I should have thought that was for your client to do. Well, if that's your view, I'm afraid there's no point in continuing this discussion. Well, how do you think you're going to prove damages? She belongs to a fast set. Anyway, I hear there's talk of marriage between her and Sir Alexander McGowan. I hardly think he's now, going to break really, the Now, really, Mr. Forsythe, hmm? if you have come to offer a substantial sum in settlement and an apology, we can talk. Otherwise... Now, look, I'm prepared to offer you a thousand pounds to settle the whole thing, but an apology is out of the question. Well, the insults have had wide currency. I... I might accept fifteen hundred. Ah. But an apology is essential. Well, if you take this thing into court, I think you'll be surprised. And sorry. Now, the whole thing's so offensive to me, I'm prepared to meet you over the money. Though I don't think a jury would award you one penny piece. Well, that is a matter of opinion. Yes. Well, as to the uh, apology, perhaps we could find a, a formula. Hmm? Something like this, that uh, we both regret that we've said hasty things about each other, uh, to be signed by both parties. Mr. Forsyth, I shall put your proposition before my client. Mm. Not because I'm afraid of the result, but mm. because, as you say, these cases there, well, they're not very edifying. Miss Ferrar? Yes? Good morning. I represent Spence Clark Literary Ventures. Who? We promote advanced literature. I'm calling on certain people in society with a known interest in the arts, and I wondered whether you would care to buy a copy of Canthar by Percival Calvin. Oh, that? Yes, it's um, rousing great interest and has been widely praised. So I believe. I've read it. Oh. Even so, if you were to buy a copy, it would be a very great investment. The price is rising steadily and... Uh, it will be very valuable in time. I hope you're right. I've already got a copy. Oh. In that case, madam, I'm sorry to trouble you. Good morning. Good morning. Who's that? Oh, a man selling books. I didn't want any. Oh. How much this? Drawing. Rather good. And that American? Of course. He's been here. Often. I'm thinking of painting him. It's a good face. You lied to me. You said he was in Paris. Did I? Are you playing fast and loose with me? Of course. Why not? <laughs> you won't paint him. He won't come here again. He's in love with you. Well, he can't help that. And at least he's civilised. And I'm Let not. Go. No, I'm a plain man. Out of a dull novel. Now, don't be so disagreeable and let go. Pick up that sketch block. I'm damned if I will. Then our engagement's off. If you're old-fashioned, I'm not. You want a woman who'll give you a whip for a wedding present. I want you too much to be saying. Then pick up that book. Oh, I bumped into a door. <laughs> Poor door. <laughs> You're the hardest woman I've ever known. Why I love you, I'll never know. It hasn't improved your temper anyway. I'm sorry. Alex, seriously, do you think we can be happy together? What are the prospects? Pretty poor, I think. Whiskey and soda? No. It's in the cupboard. No, nothing. We'd better understand each other. If I'm going to marry you, which is doubtful, I'm not going into Perda. I shall have whatever friends I like, and until we're married, I shall even see them. If you don't like it, you can lump it. I'm not dependent on you, Alex, so don't ever think it. If I want to, I can go tomorrow to South Carolina, where the dark is croon and the sun shines and the mockingbird sings sweeter than the nightingale. <laughs> At least that's the story, and half of it must be true. <laughs> I can't see you in a swamp festooned with moss. No. Could happen if my debt's paid. And this could do it. Old Forsyte's offered fifteen hundred pounds. What's 
the matter? It's this letter. I'd like you to read it. All right, but announce our engagement. I suppose I might as well. In the Times, tomorrow. Yes, well, this is all right as far as it goes, I suppose. But an apology is essential. You'll not settle for less. I'll instruct Settle White. What's the matter? You're shivering. Nothing. Someone walked over my grave, that's all. How is Kit? Fine. Do you want to go up and see him? Uh, yes. Uh, later. Oh. Yes, you should hear this. It's from Settlewright. Uh, dear sir, your proposition was duly placed before our client. We are instructed to say that she will accept the sum of £1,500 and an apology <laughs> duly, duly signed by your client, copy of which we enclose. This is ridiculous. Uh, I, Mrs. Michael Mont, withdraw the words concerning Miss Marjorie Ferrer contained in my letters to Mrs. Ralph Penryn and Mrs. Edward Maltese of October the 4th last, hereby tender a full and free apology for having written them. Well, you don't expect me to sign don't that? Don't get into a tizzy. Well, what do you expect Look, me listen, to do? listen, I'm sending this reply. I have your letter of yesterday's date and note that your client has rejected my proposition, which, as you know, was made entirely without prejudice and is now withdrawn in toto. Oh, sweetie. I'm not surprised. Oh, good for you. Good for you. I'll be sorry. <laughs> well, of course, you know who's put her up to this, don't you? Huh? Did you read Saturday's Times? No. She's announced her engagement to McGowan. Oh, and uh, did Michael tell you that he hit him on the nose? What? Whose nose? And McGowan, sweetie. It bled like Billy O. Now, what on earth did he want to do a thing well, like this? didn't you read his attack on Michael? Oh, that, yes. Oh, parliamentary stuff. It was a bit of, like schoolboys down there. So she's going to marry him, is she? Mm-hmm. Well, we shall see. Every word I said was true. Yes, I dare say, but it isn't evidence. All we've got to go on so far is Butterfield's report. Well, useful, no doubt, but... Oh, and that uh, story about her affair with that uh, painter chap, Green. Oh, and what's all this about uh, play-acting? Hmm? Well, all I know is that she's playing Olivia in The Plain Dealer. Ah. Now, is that an advanced play? Rather. About 250 years old. Yeah. Yes, well, they were a coarse lot in those days. Aubrey Green is doing the decor. Is what? Uh, the scenery, sweetie. Oh, yes. Uh, mm. Yes, well, uh, I shall go and have a look at it. Well, you won't like it. Well, I hope not. Oh, by the way, when Michael comes in, would you tell... By the way, where is he? In uh, Bethnal Green. Bethnal... A woman called Nora Curfew runs a home for poor children down there. She she wrote to him about his speech, so he's gone down there to see the crash. Slum children. Mm -hmm. Yes, you'll come home with something catching. I shouldn't wonder. We'll make him gargle. I shall. Mm. Oh, shall we go up? Yes, Nanny, you'll be delighted. Oh, oh why? Well, kid always eats his tea so much better when you're there. <laughs> Nonsense. Really? Oh well. Oh, I'll right, go on up. Hello? Yes, this is Mrs. Michael Mont speaking. Ah, uh, madam, this is the Langham Hotel manager speaking. We are deeply sorry to trouble you, but we don't quite know where to turn. We have a young American gentleman here, a Mr. Francis Wilmot. Oh, yes, I do know Mr. Wilmot, but... He's very ill, madam. Pneumonia. Well, I'll come at once. Uh, the, the Langham Hotel. Thank you, madam. We should be most obliged. Me a taxi as quickly as possible. Yes, ma'am. And uh, when you've got it, I want you to give this note to Jenny and ask her to take it round to Chelsea. It's very urgent. And uh, could you tell Mrs. Forsyth that I had to go out? Uh, I'll ring them as soon as I can. Yes, ma'am. Now remember, this note is to be given to Jenny. It's to go round to Chelsea. It's extremely urgent. How long has he been like this? 
I've noticed him looking poorly, ma'am. But we didn't know how bad he was till today. I think he's just neglected it. Poor gentleman. You see, he's hardly there. But there ought to be a nurse. She's been sent for, ma'am. Francis? Francis, are you in any pain? If you would try and cure me, I'll hate you. I just want to quit. You mustn't talk like that. It's, it's un-American. Of course you're not going to quit. this, ma'am. Ought I to show it to the doctor? Pathetic, isn't it, ma'am? She's throwing him over, see? Hmm. It looks like it. Well, I, uh, I suggest you keep it. If it gets better, give it him back. If not, burn it. Yes, ma'am. Well, I'm not the lady. Oh, no, ma'am. No, I'm sure. No, no, no. I'll go. You stay with Mr. Wilmot. So the note was from you. I thought I recognized your writing. You have reason to, haven't you? How is he? Very ill indeed. W would you like to sit down? I'll uh, tell him you're here. Francis. She's here. Marjorie. Well, tell her. Tell her I'm finished with that fool business. Thank her for coming. He doesn't want to see you. He says he's finished with that fool business. He thanks you for coming. I'm sorry to have brought you up here. Not a bit. Will he get well? He doesn't seem to want to. Oh. Will you make it up? <laughs> 